Well, uh, inflammation has become uh, one of the major health problems of our time. Not the only problem, but it is substantially involved in the pandemics of chronic degenerative disease that are overwhelming our healthcare service. Very quickly, in, chronic inflammation is now understood to be a major cause of chronic degenerative non-communicable disease. But today, we're not going to talk about that so much. Instead, we'll talk about the way in which chronic inflammatory stress impacts on uh, performance, recovery rates, resilience in physical activities, athletics and sporting events. So for those of you who are athletes, who are sports persons, whether they're uh, single sports or team sports, then this is directly relevant to you. So Andrew, would you uh, move the presentation on to the next slide, please? Um, I just want to uh, differentiate between the two types of inflammation that um, we experience and explain how they differ and what their roles are. It's very important to be able to mount an inflammatory response because this is part of the way in which we defend ourselves against pathogens, which could be an invading bacterium or virus, or it could be uh, mold, um, or, or indeed against injury. When invaded by a pathogen, the chronic inflammatory response is actually one of the most important ways in which we defend ourselves against these invading pathogens. And if you have experienced uh, an acute injury, which could be, a, could be a knife wound, or it could simply be the result of an abrasion to the skin. Again, the acute inflammatory response is the part of the way in which the body responds to that injury and initiates the cascade of events that eventually resolves uh, that wound. Um, under those circumstances, the, there is a release of various inflammatory compounds, a recruitment of various inflammatory and other cell types. And this uh, results in the removal of the threat, the, the neutralization of the threat. At that point, the inflammatory sequence is stopped. An anti-inflammatory sequence is initiated. The healing is completed and you go back to normal. Now, if you have... Um, for whatever reason, move from acute inflammation into chronic inflammation, this is very different. This is nothing to do with healing. It's nothing to do with protecting you against the invading pathogens or against injury. You now have a situation where the inflammatory cascade has been unleashed. And for whatever reason, the accelerator is on, the brakes are not being properly applied. And so the body, instead of resolving the inflammation, once the original tar you know, the stimulus has started, it has been neutralized, the inflammation does not stop, it continues, it becomes more extensive, and this results in the release of inflammatory mediators, including a group of very destructive enzymes called matrix metalloprotease enzymes. And what these do, they lead to the slow, progressive, and excessive destruction of healthy tissue. Now, if this is taking place in the cartilage of a joint, you will move towards osteoarthritis. If it is taking place inside the, um, the organic phase of bone, you will move progressively towards osteoporosis. If it is occurring in the skin, this is what contributes to skin aging. And if this is happening in the linings of your arteries, this will lead to the progressive erosion of the linings of the arteries and the development of atheroma, and you will move gradually towards hypertension, coronary artery disease, and a heart attack or stroke. If you have chronic inflammation in muscles and ligaments, this will lead not to improved fitness, but to gradual destruction of healthy tissue. So acute inflammatory stress, good. 
chronic inflammatory stress bad? And I'll talk a little bit about what the different factors are, which will determine whether your response to a trigger, whether it could be a new exercise, whether it is an acute inflammatory response, which is positive and leads to improvements in muscle structure and function and fitness, improved ligament strength, or whether instead, perhaps because of external dietary factors, your body is more likely to develop a chronic inflammatory response, and which leads to deterioration in muscle structure, deterioration in muscle function, and deterioration in performance. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, if you undertake uh, an exercise for the first time, let's say it's January the 1st, and you have a New Year's resolution, this is the year I'm going to go to the gym, this is the year I'm going to hit the running track, this is the year that I'm going to get fit. To begin with, and this happens every time you exercise a previously not very much used muscle group, you will experience muscle and joint pain. Now this is due to inflammation. Hopefully it's just acute inflammatory stress. And the reason why you have this degree of inflammation is that when you're using an underused muscle and or ligament, you will develop micro damage to that muscle micro tears to the muscle and the ligament. Um, and this is part and parcel of getting fit. It is the response to that initial damage, which is incurred particularly in eccentric exercise, um, that leads to this series of resolving processes that improves muscle structure and fitness. That is what a healthy training regime looks like. Now, if you have this acute inflammatory response after exercise, this is something that takes place over a relatively short period of time. Typically, it will start to become apparent two hours after the exercise, and it may go on for as long as 48 hours of the exercise. And what this represents is a correct and physiologically appropriate amount of autophagy. That autophagy really means the destruction, the breaking down of old muscle fibers and structures and their replacement with new ones. And as everybody knows, I think, the more exercise that you do, the more you train, if you're doing this properly in a slowly and graded way, with time, the muscle becomes fitter to the point where repeating that exercise no longer causes inflammation because the muscle has reorganized itself. It has become adapted to this new level of exercise and you now have increased fitness. Regular good training is very much anti-inflammatory. It leads to the production of anti-inflammatory mediators in the muscle and other tissues, which reduce inflammation in the muscle and help to reduce inflammatory stress in other parts of the body, which is why regular exercise regimes are good not only for physical fitness, but have so many health benefits in many other tissues as well. Could we go to the next slide? Now, the problem is that uh, if you have uh, undertaken the wrong type of exercise, perhaps you've gone at it too hard, too fast, too early in the season, and particularly if you're not eating the right kinds of foods, then you end up with excessive uh, post-exercise inflammation and excessive post-inflammation damage. If this happens, then this prevents the normal regeneration of muscle tissue, and you end up with a very limited increase in fitness. There may be no increase whatsoever, and you end up with overuse injuries. This is not a good idea if you're a professional, if you're involved in competitive sports or athletics, because this kind of delayed onset muscle soreness, which is known as DOM to uh, people in the trade, it, uh, it impairs activity. And it's uh, difficult to measure just how, uh, to what extent physical activity is impaired, but people have tried to do this. Uh, and the best evidence that we have suggests that if you have created excessive inflammatory stress, that will impair your efficiency of doing something like running by as much as 3%. And of course, if you're 3% less efficient, uh, you're, you're no longer in the gold position. You're probably not in silver or bronze either. You're probably not going to be on the uh, winning podium at all. 3% is a very, very big difference at the upper end of competitive scores. 
so this kind of, this type of chronic inflammatory stress is um, not adaptive, uh, unlike the innate and adoptive aspects of acute inflammatory stress, chronic inflammatory stress, excessive inflammatory stress after exercise is extremely maladaptive. Now, I think that we all are familiar with this pattern of exercising a new muscle group and then being very painful, very achy after that. Uh, the odd thing is that you do not see this in animals in the wild. And I don't think that we experienced this either when uh, back in the day in the uh, Neolithic era when we were living in caves and eating uh, a diet that was probably much closer to the desires that we were designed uh, to live on. Um, if you look at vestigial cultures, and there are one or two places in the world where these still exist, uh, people who are living, for example, in the tribal areas of India, they do not seem to experience post-exercise excessive inflammatory stress at all, because they have a, an internal milieu, an internal environment, um, and a diet which is profoundly anti-inflammatory. It doesn't stop them from developing acute inflammatory responses, so they have extremely good immune systems, but they do not suffer from excessive chronic inflammatory stress. So they go out running one day, and the next day they'll be able to do it again without any impairment in running economy. Next slide, please. So what causes the exercise, the inflammation that we, we see in our athletes, in our sports people um, after exercise? Uh, as I said, it's all to do with the right amount of muscle damage and the right amount of muscle repair. So you have mini trauma, more accurately, it's micro trauma. Uh, the, the rupture of um, uh, muscular fibrils, which triggers what we call housekeeping responses. These are responses which clear away the damaged tissue, replace it with new fibrils, and lead to, um, and will also include the, the development of increased numbers of mitochondria. So now you have increased contractile strength. If you're doing the right kind of training, you may have increased muscle mass as well, increased mitochondria, increased glucose receptors, the muscle becomes more insulin sensitive. In other words, you're training, you're getting fitter. It's all a matter of degree. You need a small amount of this kind of response, but if you have a, an excessively strong inflammatory response, as I said, it's counterproductive. And what determines more than anything else, whether your body is going to be capable of, 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 of mounting the appropriate level of inflammatory stress and not excessive, that is largely down to dietary factors. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> I talked a moment ago about our Neolithic ancestors living in the wild, about people living in uh, vestigial cultures. Unlike ours, and is not full of pro-inflammatory nutrients, which our diet is. It's, that's the reason why they don't get in this downward spiral of excessive uh, post-exercise chronic inflammatory stress and delayed onset muscle symptoms and pains. The traditional diet is uh, packed with a group of anti-inflammatory nutrients. There is quite a wide range, but three of the most important are omega-3, highly unsaturated fatty acids, so EPA and DHA, most uh, typically derived from seafood, which can be all the way through from cold water marine algae through to uh, cold water oil fish or cold water marine mammals. And then along with those omega-3s, the other two major categories of anti-inflammatory nutrients in any traditional diet are the polyphenols, which you find in uh, typically in berry fruits and in spices, and the prebiotic fibers, and these are very interesting non-digestible carbohydrates that you find in the highest concentrations in foods, in pulses and legumes. So a traditional diet will contain large amounts, significant amounts of those three anti-inflammatory nutrients. Come up to the, uh, the modern era and look at today's diet and what you see is that those three major anti-inflammatory nutrient categories have been largely lost. 
and they have been replaced thanks to the uh, multinational uh, food production companies with a group of nutrients that are no longer anti-inflammatory but are profoundly pro-inflammatory. And I'll, I mean, again, there's quite a few of those. I'll single out three. The omega-6 high unsaturated fatty acids, which uh, are basically terrestrial plant oils, so soy oil, corn oils, safflower oil, oils like that. Advanced glycation end comp products and advanced lipoxidation end products. And these are products which are uh, formed in food when it is cooked at high temperatures. So when you take a piece of bread and put it in the toaster and it browns, you're actually forming some uh, AGE compounds, but really only relatively small levels. The reason why we have much more of a problem with these compounds in our diet today is because the multinational food production companies use much higher cooking technology uh, temperatures than we do at home. And many of the ultra processed foods that we eat so much of these days contain far higher levels of these pro-inflammatory compounds than uh, we would produce in our own foods at home or that were traditionally consumed. There are other pro-inflammatory factors in the modern diet as well. I won't go into all of them, but I will, I think, mention sugar. Uh, because the traditional diet contains very little sugar indeed. Our diet, in marked distinction to that, uh, in North America, people are now consuming um, almost 200 pounds of sugar a year, not just in confectionaries and, and biscuits and cookies and things like that, or sodas, but the sugar has been stuffed into all kinds of other foods, and many, many ultra-processed foods are full of sugar. Um, if you're consuming 200 pounds of sugar a year, this is almost a quarter of all the calories that you will eat in any given year. These are empty calories. And if you're filling your, filling your diet, your plate, and your body full of sugar, this creates what we call glycative stress. This leads to the formation of advanced glycation end products in the body, and this is also pro-inflammatory. So, in distinction to the traditional diet, to the diet that we ate in Europe and North America as recently as the second half of the 19th century. Today's diet, today's ultra-processed diet, has become highly pro-inflammatory. And this has a very dramatic and very direct on sporting and on athletic performance. Next to that, please. <laughs> well, this is a rather exaggerated uh, example of the modern diet. These are so-called junk foods. And these are foods with a very high calorie density, a very low nutrient density, a lot of sugar, a lot of salt, a lot of omega-3s, very little prebiotics, very little omega-3s, very little polyphenols. This is a diet that has been shown to lead to overweight, to cheese, to an increased risk of cancer and heart disease and increased risk of early death and a lot of chronic inflammation. And the drinks are perhaps the worst example of these ultra processed foods because they contain lots and lots of sugar, unless you're eating, drinking a diet drink and no nutrients whatsoever. So the nutrient density of drinks like Pepsi and Coke, uh, Mountain Dew and the rest of those terrible things, the nutrient density is zero. The calorific density is very, very high and many of the so-called sports drinks, such as Gatorade, uh, are really no better. They're junk, really junk, not good for you, not good for performance. Next slide, please. Now, if you're eating a diet which is depleted in the anti-inflammatory nutrients, and which contains excessive amounts of the pro-inflammatory nutrients, then you start to activate this kind of machinery. Now, I won't get into it, in detail, uh, but the, what I want to point is that everything inside that circle is taking place inside the cell. It could be an immune cell, such as a macrophage. And instead, I'm going to look at that bar right at the bottom because it's much simpler. Uh, that is where inflammation is taking place outside the immune cell, but in the tissues. And some people refer to this as the inflammer zone, spelled Z-O-N-E, -E, zone. So I'm going to go to the next slide, which is a simpler, simpler version to show how this works. So the inflammasome, uh, there's 
this is old text, this should be the zone, not the stone, um, can be regarded as uh, a kind of uh, bicameral system. By that, I mean it has two major compartments. And in the upper compartment, could you build the presentation of this slide, please? Uh, what happens in this upper compartment is really very uh, deeply influenced by the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in your cell membranes. Now that is a reflection of the ratio of the omega-6s and 3s that you have been consuming in your diet for the previous three to four months. So this is uh, really an important uh, number. This tells us uh, how ready the cell is, the cell with that ratio in it is, to start to get involved in an inflammatory sequence. Now today, because we have a very high six to three ratio, on average in Europe, it's about 15 to one. In North America, it's about 25 to one. And in reality, it should be below five and probably below three. We have a ratio that's far too high. And what that means is that once immune cells become activated, perhaps you know, the initial muscle damage, or as I said, a pathogen, then in this first half of the inflammasome, these immune cells are releasing little vesicles called lysosomes and exosomes. And can you start releasing them, please? And as they are released, if you have a high six to three ratio, these little droplets that the cell is releasing are pro-inflammatory. They release enzymes called uh, proteases and also other enzymes called matrix metalloproteases. And these enzymes are incredibly destructive. They cause widespread tissue destruction. Uh, and here we can see the reason why this system is out of balance, because the six to three ratio, now you, you do look to the bottom right, you can see those bottom two lines, there's the sixes and there's the threes, in the bottom right hand corner. You can see that until about 1900, as far as we can tell from all the data sources available to us, the ratio between the sixes and threes in our diet and therefore in our cell membranes was kept within two to one, three to one, perhaps five to one. And that is a good ratio. That is a ratio that does not encourage excessive or chronic inflammation. But after 1900, things start to change. The food industry starts to become involved. Our intake of omega-3s starts to fall. And our intake of plant oils, omega-6s, starts to increase because the food industry has developed ways of stabilizing these and they become very cheap, they have a long shelf life, and the food industry packs more and more of them into our foods to make them taste better or to give them a better mouthfeel. And the six to three ratio goes up and up and up from three and five to one to 15 to one, as I said, today on average in Europe and 25 to one in North America. So the first section of the inflammasome is out of balance. It is running hot. Next slide, please. Uh, well, yes, the target is five to one. Uh, it depends on who you talk to, of course, or where you think that target is. The Nordic Council of Health Ministers believes that it should be below five to one. The uh, Czech um, government, who I think have taken a very proactive stance on this, and they're looking very carefully at the science, are just about to recommend a ratio of three to one. And I think the Czechs are correct. The Nordic Council of Health Ministers have been a little conservative, and I think that they will probably start to lower that number as we go forward. So there's a, a lot of uh, scientific support for lowering the ratio, and in, as I, in increasing now, we see governmental support as well. Uh, the government aren't necessarily interested in making us healthier. They're not interested in our well-being, but they are interested in saving on healthcare costs. And if we can prevent chronic inflammatory stress, you reduce the numbers of people who go on to develop heart disease, dementia, cancers, which are so expensive to treat. Next slide, please. Well, uh, so we talked about the omega-6-3 ratio getting too high and compromising the functionality of the first phase in the inflammasome. In the second phase, uh, the polyphenols play a role because the second phase, that's where the matrix metalloprotease enzymes are active, if you remember. And in a healthy diet, you should be eating lots of polyphenols because one of the things they do, they're very anti-inflammatory, they block those matrix metalloprotease enzymes. Um, 
In fact, they also downregulate the genes which express for those highly destructive enzymes. So if you're eating lots of polyphenol, which we always used to, then you're releasing less of these destructive enzymes and the enzymes that you do release are less active. So how much fruit and veg should we be eating? Well, the government says we should be eating five a day based on absolutely no evidence at all. It's far too low. Uh, according to uh, the best evidence we have from uh, Tufts University, the Department of Human, the USDA Department of Human Nutrition, they say that to really start to bring those matrix metalloprotease enzymes under control, you should be eating 10 portions of fruits and vegetables a day. So we, we're told to eat five. Most of us don't even manage that. In fact, the real average in the West is about three. At that level of intake, frankly, you don't have really any protective effect whatsoever. But if you go back to earlier societies, and one of those is the mid-Victorian society, very, very act, ultra-processed foods at all. And what we know from uh, the thorough investigation of their dietary habits is that they were consuming an average of 10 portions of fruits and vegetables a day, which might seem like a lot to you. But having tried for several months to live and work like a mid-Victorian, very intensive and high levels of physical activity a day, under those conditions, eating 10 portions of fruits and vegetables a day is actually very, very easy. So we're eating on average about three portions a day. Our great, great grandparents were eating about three times more fruits and vegetables than we're eating. But it's a bit more complicated than that because not only were they consuming more fruits and vegetables, but they were consuming different fruits and vegetables. What they ate is not like the fruits and vegetables we eat today. If you could get hold of the heritage strains of fruits and vegetables, what you will find is that they taste very different. They are not nearly as sweet as the fruits and vegetables we eat today. Baby carrots, baby peas, I mean, uh, sweet corn, these are full of, full of sugar because that's what the consumer likes. That's what the plant breeders have produced. But four or five generations ago, as recently as that, these fruits and vegetables were considerably less full of sugar. And because they weren't being told to produce sugar, they were putting more of their energy into producing compounds called phytoalexins, which are basically plant defense compounds, such as polyphenols, carotenoids, xanthophils, and compounds like that, which we think of as phytonutrients, but which plants used to produce in far higher levels. When you compare the levels of the polyphenols in the plants today to the fruits and vegetables that were eaten 150 years ago, we can tell that levels of polyphenols in particular have fallen by 50 to 60 percent. Do the math. If our ancestors were eating three times as much fruits and vegetables as we were today, if the fruits and vegetables they were eating contained levels of polyphenols which are three times higher than the levels we find in the fruits and vegetables we eat today, obviously our intake of polyphenols has been reduced by 90%. It has fallen by an order of magnitude. So now you can begin to see that not only the upper chamber in the inflammasome, but also the lower chamber in the inflammasome is out of control. The brakes are off. Both of them are running hot. Next slide, please. So the system has been um, speeding, it's out of control. It's releasing these very destructive enzymes, these matrix metalloprotease enzymes. And what they do is they break down the fibers in the extracellular matrix. Now there are many, many fibers. Collagen, there's uh, 10 or 11 different types of collagen, but there's elastin, um, lactin, laminectin, lots of other fibers. This is a very complicated physiological system of microfibers that runs through every cubic micrometer of our tissues. And these fibers hold our cells together, hold them in the correct orientation so that they can speak to each other, so they can coordinate, they can function collectively as a tissue or as an organ. The matrix metalloprotease enzymes are so destructive because they break down, they dissolve each of these microfibers. And when they do that, then your cells can no longer hang together. They can no longer coordinate. They can no longer 
communicate to each other. And organized tissue breaks down and disintegrates. It turns into mush. You may be familiar with these extra, uh, the, the, these matrix proteases because they are the same enzymes that are produced by the so-called flesh-eating bacteria. And this unfortunate lady was uh, in, infected by a flesh-eating bacterium, which was producing all these destructive enzymes. And as you can see, it dissolved half of her face. It dissolved, these enzymes dissolve skin and ligament and cartilage and bone. They dissolve everything, they dissolve us. And it is those same enzymes, the same almost identical enzymes, which are released in smaller amounts over long periods of time in chronic inflammation. Next slide, please. So in chronic inflammatory stress, it's the release of these tissues into the joints that leads to osteoarthritis, uh, into the bones that lead to osteoporosis, into the landings of your arteries, and just recapitulating what I said earlier, that leads to the erosion of the artery wall, the development of hypertension, the development of coronary artery disease. And if this is happening in muscle and in ligaments, and this is what does happen if you're eating a modern pro-inflammatory diet, instead of after exercise an acute response, healing and improved fitness, if you're eating this modern pro-inflammatory diet, then you will end up with excessive damage to the muscle and the ligament and the joints. You will end up, instead of getting fitter quickly and in a physiologically appropriate manner, you will end up with delayed onset muscle pain and stiffness. You will end up with excessive breakdown of connective tissue, and you will not see the improvement in performance, in stamina and fitness to anything like the levels that you deserve and that you should have where you eating a more evolutionary suitable diet. And of course, at the end of the day, as any performer knows, this results in loss of a performance. Next slide, please. So the logic suggests that if we can change your diet in a way that will move it away from being pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory, it should have significant results on improved fitness, improved responses to training, improved recovery rates, improved training during practice periods, and improved performance when you're actually competing. Does it really work? Yes, I can tell you, it really does. Next slide, please. So this is uh, something that we call our preventive healthcare program. Can you build the slide, please? Now, because I'm working on an iPhone as opposed to a computer, <laughs> I can't really see what's going on here. Um, but I think if I move this picture around, you should be able to see with me that uh, there's the red on the left, that is the placebo group. The green is uh, the group after they had been given an anti-inflammatory regime. And you can see that the days off from illness and the days off from injury were both significantly reduced. And if we look at the absence from training and from games in terms of days per month, this particular group, which is a uh, first division football team in, uh, in Norway, their absences were vastly reduced. And of course, this meant they had more time to practice together during the off season. They had more team to play together as a team during the season. And the more a team plays together, the better they become at learning each other's patterns of play, anticipating each other's responses, they get better. And this particular team, I think, uh, jumped six places up the, the league in that one season alone. Uh, they were absolutely delighted with that. And I want to tell you that this was our first uh, intervention of its sort in this area. We were only working with a very basic set of pharmaconutritional tools, and we can achieve much more than that now. But even with our first attempt, with what were really a basic, very basic set of pharmaconutritional tools, we were getting really remarkable, very significant improvements in our players' performance, behavior, motivation, and, 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 uh, and sporting performance. Next slide, please. Uh, 
so this here we have the uh, the Norwegian elite women, and I just want to show you their befores and afters. And what we're looking at here are their six to three ratios, uh, the red columns of the befores, and what you can see in each individual case uh, by putting them onto this omega three polyphenol combination within three to four months, we were achieving this quite dramatic restructuring of the cell membranes in their bodies, which meant that they were moving from being excessively chronically inflammatory to being physiologically adapted to exercise. In other words, they were now, instead of having excessive post-exercise muscle pain, stiffness, inflammation, and damage, they were having the right amount. They were triggering the right amount of muscular repair, the right amount of mitochondrial neogenesis, the right amount of autophagy and housekeeping, and this was very consistent. And this is measured not by ourselves, but by an independent third party laboratory uh, at the University of Oslo. So we're very confident in these results. They've been published uh, in various scientific papers and these scientific papers have gone on, have gone on to become uh, very heavily cited and uh, they've had inordinate amounts of reads. They've become very influential. The next, paper, the next um, slide, please. Now this is um, where we have gotten to at the moment. We started off really just with the balance oil, which is an omega-3 uh, polyphenol combination. And what we have now gone on to do is we've now started to address other sources of excessive inflammatory stress in the body, which cannot be addressed by the balance oil on its own. So chronic inflammatory stress in the intestines is determined not by the six to three ratio so much, but by the overall population of microbes that live in the large bowel, the microbiome more technically correctly, the microbiota. Now, I, right at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that one of the anti-inflammatory nutrients that we used to eat but is gone are the prebiotic fibers. The prebiotic fibers are anti-inflammatory because they change the population of the microbiome in the gut, flipping it over from being gram-negative to gram-positive. Now that is a very positive step for athletes or indeed for anyone interested in their health because that changes the microbiome from being pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. So this is a very logical addition to balanced soil. We're now extending this concept of improved anti-inflammatory milieu throughout the whole of the body. And for those of you who have um, perhaps looked into the area of probiotics and prebiotics before, this has been shown to improve stamina by changing the microbiome. And this formulation over here on the right, the, uh, which is called Xenobiotic, is extremely effective in doing exactly that, in con reconfiguring the microbiome from being a 21st century pro-inflammatory microbiome to back to being a more uh, something, something that's more like a 19th century anti-inflammatory microbiome, which of course is the microbiome that we co-evolved with, and it is the one that suits us best. There is uh, one other uh, additional uh, tool that we use, which is called Extend. And what this does, it replaces all of the other micro and phytonutrients that have been removed from today's diet. Extend has anti-inflammatory effects of its own, but it has additional functions as well. It is also designed to support the immune system. It uses some very, very specific nutrients to do that. And I can tell you, uh, speaking as a former chair of the Scientific Advisory uh, Board on Biothera, which for many, many years was the uh, market and actually one of the academic leaders in this whole area, these are compounds where we invested, I think, $300 million into demonstrating their superior performance in improving the immune system in a way which makes you less inflammatory, more able to ward off infection, and less vulnerable to allergy at the same time. So a whole host of benefits. Extend is like the Swiss army knife of nutritional supplements. It starts off with what looks a little bit like a vitamin A to Z, but then adds many, many layers onto that, and basically restores your um, man, nutritional profile to the profile we would expect to see in a blue zone, such as the mid-Victorian era, or if we go back far enough 
to the uh, Neolithic era. We're, we're going to turn you all into Stone Age savages and uh, hopefully give you the, the strength, the speed, the resilience, and the stamina that goes along with that. Next slide, please. Well, uh, Zalgiris. <laughs> they've been using this program. And uh, the one thing about Algeria that is interesting is, firstly, they're an extremely, uh, extremely good team. But the other thing that's interesting about them is they have fantastic stamina. Uh, they have a track record of winning all of their games in the last quarter. So other teams can keep up with them to begin with. And then what Zalgiris do, because they have such a fantastically good stamina, they are really very, very fit. Not that their physical regimes are different from anyone else, but their diets are, their nutritional profiles are really radically better. They are able to continue into the fourth quarter and maintain the same level of accuracy, speed, physical intensity that they had throughout the rest of the game. And that's when all the other teams are starting to fall back. That's when Zalgiris wins. Great team, and I'm very, very happy to be able to be associated with them. Next slide. And what has happened is partly as a result of our experimental work, our early work uh, in Norway, and partly because of the really uh, amazing results that Zalgiris have been producing, we are now seeing more and more sporting teams coming to us. So we have football teams in various parts of the world, ice hockey teams, uh, basketball teams, and we have a lot of cyclists, skiers, and runners who are now also starting to use this approach. And in all of these sports, they are people who are making new and, and, and better personal bests than anything they have done in the past. Not only that, I think I want to make one other point before we wind this uh, discussion up. There are other ways of improving performance. There are steroids. There are stimulants. I mean, we you know we don't like to talk about these things. We know people use them. You can have your athletics career terminated for uh, using drugs like that. And they will improve performance in the short term, but in the long term, very bad for your health. Our approach is very different. Our approach allows you to develop your body to its maximum appropriate physiological level, but there is no downside. With this approach, by improving your nutritional profile, you are guaranteed to experience better health after your sporting career is over. It will continue to support you, continue to protect you against the, what we call the lifestyle diseases, which are largely caused by today's diet. So this is a gift that keeps on giving. And this is not just for use on the sports field or the running track or the gym. This is a, a lifestyle intervention. And it'll uh, allow you to remain fitter, healthier, younger, for longer. Thank you. Perhaps there'll be time for questions. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not very commercial. Um, the organizers wanted, to, wanted me to mention the fact that there's various books that go into a lot of this in more detail. The, the first book that uh, really covered this is called Out of the Fire. It's a, really a, a semi-specialist text chock full of references and it's for medical scientists, medical students and doctors. Uh, for lay persons, these books are more accessible. The first book, Let Your Food Be Your Pharmacognutrition, which talks about inflammatory stress, uh, how to counter it, and how to improve your nutritional profile. And the second book, which was written before COVID, shows you how to improve the efficiency of your immune system to help you to ward off bacteria viruses, um, autoimmune diseases too, that seems to be, play, the immune system plays a strong role there, and allergy. So these are really do-it-yourself books, uh, very accessible, very easy to read, relatively short, and uh, a nightmare to write, frankly. For me, it's easier to write detailed textbooks, much more difficult to write simplified versions, but that's... Uh, I hope I think I, th I think that more people will find them more useful. Thank you.